So I'll just say it. Blimey, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> You're all thinking it. Wow. So I'm the idiot who thought, ah, oh, it'll be fine. I'll leave the Australian summer and head north. <laughs> ah, never mind. Global warming will look after me. So is it normally this cold in New York in this this early in the season? This is warm. In November, beginning of November. Really? Oh well, I have to reschedule next year. Okay, remind me. Okay. <laughs> It gets worse. Ah, oh, nice. <laughs> Phew. That's good. So 10 degrees less than average. Now? Now is 10 degrees less than average. Now. Not Celsius. <laughs> right, I was trying to translate that. So, it always helps if you like, you know, when you, when you are Suffering always helps to think of like other people are suffering more. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> okay, look, you may contest that, and it may be to, to do with like how actually like individually evil a person is. However, <laughs> There is something true to the fact that like our own suffering and happiness and that of others is related, right? It's related in some way, even though it might not be as straightforward as that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned this morning for today, I want to focus on uh, happiness and particularly on the idea of developing happiness in meditation and following, following from a few things that people said in the interviews then um, what I thought I might do this evening is teach a little bit of metta meditation uh, because who doesn't like a bit of metta meditation, right? Right, okay, so we'll do a little bit of metta and I'll, 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 I'll teach it, I'll, I'll say a few words about it beforehand and then we can do some guided meditation and then afterwards I'll talk some more in a kind of general way about developing uh, happiness in meditation. So I'll just give you by way of introduction, so um, the particular technique of metta meditation that I'm going to teach you is uh, what I learned in Thailand uh, about was it 25 years ago now uh, from a monk called Ajahn Maha Chachai and he was my, my main meditation teacher. Ajahn Chacha is a very interesting monk, a very unusual monk. You can go and visit him when you're in Thailand if you like. He's in Bangkok. Yeah. Um, and he... Uh, what should I say about Ajahn Chacha? Well, he helped me a lot. He, he really helped me more than any other monk in learning how to meditate. And... One of the things that he taught me was about... He taught me about the way that we can take the feelings that we have in meditation, the feelings maybe of joy and so on, that can, can feel kind of passing and random and we don't really know what's going on, and we, but we can take them and we can, we can, we can consciously turn them into something which becomes very powerful and very liberating. Now, the path of meditation in the suttas is very often described in terms of joy, in terms of pleasure. The, uh, one of the greatest suttas on meditation, for example, the Samanyapala Sutta, perhaps the, the greatest of all the Buddha's teachings on practice, talks about all the different uh, stages and different aspects of practice, all of them in terms of uh, increasing and deepening and more subtle forms of joy and pleasure that you experience through the practice. Now, it's a curious thing about the human mind 
that we seem to like things that hurt us. So you're all, I'm sure, familiar with the placebo effect, but one study that was done on placebo effect once showed that if you give people uh, two sets of pills, neither of which are actual pills, one of them is just sugar, and one of them is something really bitter, then they'll both improve because of the placebo effect, but the ones who have the bitter pills will improve more. Right. So we kind of have this idea, I, I encounter this in Buddhism like all the time, like not just once or twice, not just, not just, but constantly, that if something hurts you more, it's got to be better for you. And like we do it in subtle ways, right? We're not like, we're not like, you know, got to, you know, with whips and self-flagellating, you know, we're not like doing kind of extreme self-mortification practices. We're much more, we're much more sinister than that. <laughs> we sneak in and we get you and we make you think that you're doing something for your own good and that it's all normal. But actually, you end up really hurting yourself. I've seen a lot of people hurt themselves and through their meditation practices. And they think they're doing the right thing and they think they're being mindful. And I've had people, so many people come up to me like, even like after maybe 10 years of meditation, people come up to me and they say, I ten, I've, I've been practicing this method for 10 years. And now I feel like I don't have any emotions. I feel like, I've, I feel like my, 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 my heart is just drained. All I have is just blankness there. It's very weird. It's very weird. This is not meditation as the Buddha taught it. There's no spiritual virtue in being a zombie. There's nothing intrinsically good about making yourself sit still for long periods of time. There's no you don't sort of get anything from just like completing some retreat or doing some this or some that. As, as someone else mentioned in the interviews, that, that, that these things, even though they might be, they might seem like they're, um, they seem like they're meditation and so on, but they can become just as much of a meaningless ritual as anything else. It's just like I'm going to do a retreat. And you sort of complete that number of days and that's it. And I think underlying a lot of this is still that, that kind of wrong view that we have. Yeah? And the Buddha actually identified this in the suttas. He said, formally, before he realized the path to awakening, he said he had the wrong view. He believed that pleasure was not to be gained through pleasure, but pleasure was to be gained through pain. And so this is why he did all of these self-modification practices. You know what I mean by self-modification practices? Does everyone know, know what I'm talking about? Do you know, Diana? No, you guys don't know? So in, in India, in the Buddha's day, and still today, there's a lot of ascetics who basically just torture themselves as a path to enlightenment. So torturing themselves might mean something like uh, standing on one leg for like, you know, a week at a time. Or it might mean just like uh, not lying down, right? So you're only just kind of sitting up. So uh, one monk I know, Ajahn Jai Saro, he, he used to do this practice of not lying down to sleep. What happened was, <laughs> he, he uh, see in, 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 the, in the forest tradition, monks will do this, or people, not just monks, but also lay people and so on, will do this as a kind of occasional thing, right? So you might say, well, look, I'm going to sit meditation all night or something like that, right? But then his teacher, Ajahn Chah, was getting very sick. Everyone thought he was going to die imminently like the next day or two and he thought as an offering to his teacher he made a vow he said he won't lie down until his teacher's passed away he'll just keep practicing meditation then Ajahn Chah got better <laughs> <laughs> so you want to be confident about the medical <laughs> diagnoses before making these kinds of vows right and uh, Ajahn Chah is very um, 
He's got a very strong willed, right? He's got a very kind of powerful mind and a lot of integrity. And he's like, well, I made this vow. I should have been more careful about how I phrased the fine print, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what he did. So he didn't, didn't lie down for several years. And he, he says it's a terrible practice and he doesn't recommend it for anyone, okay? <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. So one time he was traveling, and he told us this story, he was, he, one time he was traveling across India, just walking across India as a monk, and he'd walk from village to village. And he would, you know, just go for alms and, you know, sleep where he could. This is a practice that monks and nuns do uh, sometimes. And so he, did, he was doing this, but of course the catch being, of course, that he couldn't lie down, right? So one place he ended up just in some village on... Uh, in, and they put him in like a hall, like a village hall. And there was just a blank concrete hall, nothing there, just concrete. And one electric light bulb hanging from the ceiling. And he was sharing that room with a, an ascetic, right? So one of these rishis who's doing these kinds of practices. And so, uh, so Ajahn Jaisara was exhausted from he'd been walking all day. So he just sort of, you know, as soon as everything was finished, then he sort of leaned up against the wall. So he wasn't like taking it too tough, right? So he, allow, he was allowed to lean, all right? So he's leaning up against the wall and trying to get some sleep, but the light was still on. And this, this ascetic was still kind of walking backwards and forwards across the room, like doing walking meditation or something. And Ajahn Sarah was like, oh, come on, get, to, get some sleep, man. When are you going to lie down? And there was like suspended from the ceiling in this place was like some ropes and a, and a pole. And... Every so often, this kind of ascetic would come up and lean on this thing. It's like a swing, and he'd kind of lean on it for a while. And after a while, Ajahn Jayasara realized that this guy had a determination that he wouldn't sit down. <laughs> right? Much as lying down, he wouldn't sit down. And so his only sleep that he would get would be standing up and leaning on this little swing. <laughs> So the, the moral of the story being there's always someone tougher than you, right? <laughs> <laughs> you think you're doing it hard, right? So sometimes they'd stand with their arms up in the air for you know, many months or many years until the arms might wither and so on. And if you think that's tough, what about the ones who stand with two hands up in the air? <laughs> think about it, right? <laughs> okay? It's not... <laughs> not for the... For Faint-hearted, okay? Uh, so, anyway, so people would do all of these kinds of practices and many others. And, of course, the Bodhisattva himself, before his enlightenment, did many of these kinds of things. And so he was following uh, something. In, in India today, they have a religion called Jainism, where this is one of the practices they do. So the Buddha, the Bodhisattva, was either a Jain monk or certainly something very similar to a Jain monk. And this is what... They believe this is why they do it is because they believe that they can by experiencing all of this pain they can burn off all of their bad karma from the past and by burning off all of the bad karma then they can achieve enlightenment that's the that's the rationale so that's not the buddha's way so the idea that you can burn off bad karma is not a buddhist idea this is a jain idea so when we see the descriptions of meditation and the talk about meditation and spiritual practices that come from those kinds of traditions and we see the ones that come from the Buddhist tradition, it's very distinctive. The difference is very distinctive. The Buddhist teachings are so much more gentle, uh, so much more... Um, uh, they, they, they have like an ease to them. There's so much more joy to them, so much more lightness to them. And so this is something that we really have to to discover in a meditation because you know l l like it or not there is something that's always a bit uncomfortable about meditating right there's something uncomfortable about keeping that same posture and there's that restlessness that you feel and then you get sleepy and there's always these difficult feelings that you have to kind of struggle through and so what happens is that meditators often will um they're like they they they, they turn these these bad feelings that they have into a virtue right Oh, it's good that I'm suffering, right? Oh, this is where I'm learning. This is where I'm getting wisdom. This is where I'm getting insight, yeah? And of course, it's not completely untrue, right? Of course, it's true that you do learn from suffering and you learn from adversity and so on. Of course, that's true. But when you look at the way that the Buddha talked about meditation, only rarely did he talk about painful feelings in meditation. 
Yes, he did, but fairly rarely. Mostly when he talked about meditation, he talked about the joy of meditation. He talked about the pleasure of meditation. And so there's some, there comes a point where we have to allow ourselves to feel that pleasure in meditation. Because we've been programmed to think that we shouldn't really feel that good. That we don't really deserve to be happy. So I'm not going to sort of go in there and kind of psychoanalyze about why that is. But it's just enough to know that often we have, we have this blockage that's holding us and stopping us from feeling happy and feeling pleasure. So just know that this is not what the Buddha said. The Buddha said that each one of you deserves to be happy. He said that. He said you deserve to be happy. He didn't say it personally about you, but everybody, he said you deserve to be happy. All sentient beings deserve to be happy. And that includes you, like it or not, right? <laughs> and no matter how guilty you might feel, no matter how much lack of self-worth you might feel, no matter how much of a bad person that you think you are, you still deserve to be happy. Sorry, but that's just it, okay? You just have to deal with it. Now, when we do metta meditation, metta meditation is one of the fastest ways of bringing happiness to the mind. It's very direct. Like if you do breath meditation, breath meditation also can bring you happiness. And for some people, then that's fine. But my experience doing breath meditation was that I would do a lot of breath meditation and you know, maybe occasionally you might feel a bit of pleasure or a bit of joy coming from there. You know? But it's a long and uncertain road. But then when I started doing metta meditation, it came up right away. Thought, wow, there's so much joy and so much happiness. And you realize, actually, it's just there. And once you realize it's just there, then you can turn your mind to it whenever you like, no matter what meditation that you're doing. Right? So it's not become something that's not just useful in metta meditation, but it teaches you that those feelings are always there. Now, most of the time when people teach metta meditation, and like I said before, like all the methods that you can learn are good and those kinds of things, but most of the time when people teach metta meditation, they usually teach it as a bit of an adjunct, right? So it's something that could, you know, you can supplement your breath meditation or your vipassana or whatever it is that you're doing. That's fine, you want to do that. But what Ajahn Chachan did was he made it sort of the core meditation for reaching deep samadhi. And so he, he set up a system which is very precise, quite detailed. Like it's, not, it's not like super detailed like some meditations, but relatively speaking, it's quite structured and quite detailed. And we'll only touch upon a few details here. So if you want to know more about it, then you can look up some of my talks on the web or whatever. Uh, but we're just going to touch a few details of it here that I think are going to be the most useful as a general practice for people to do. Now couple of things that is useful to remember for Ajahn Mahachachai's method in particular. Number one is that we always keep our awareness focused inside your body. Okay? So the metta is not floating around the universe. Okay? This is, you even do that even if you're developing metta for other people. Okay? Number two, the metta, when the metta comes, the metta is always associated with a pleasant feeling. So don't worry too much about like exactly what is this metta, is this rapture, is this this, is this compassion or something. Don't worry too much about it. But make sure that your intention is there and then when that pleasant feeling comes, you just keep that pleasant feeling in mind. Yeah? Keeping your, your awareness focused inside your body. So these are the main things to remember when beginning this meditation. Now for this meditation, we don't, the, the, uh, uh, the primary um, basis of the meditation is that feeling of metta. This is what it's about. This is what we're looking for. Okay? So we begin by using words. And we can use the words, may I be happy. And we repeat those words. 
but the words are not the thing, right? The words are just there to direct your attention and to clarify your intention and your purpose. Metta, at its heart, is about the pure and un, uh, uncomplicated wish for the happiness of oneself and the happiness of others. All right, that's what metta is. So metta is like part of or an aspect of what we call love. Love, of course, is much more complicated or includes many other kinds of things. And it's important to remember that in metta meditation, that metta meditation is not for your therapy. Okay, so we don't want any weird, perverse love-hate relationships here. Okay, <laughs> I was teaching this in Singapore one time. There was a young married couple in the front of the thing, and as soon as I said this, they immediately looked at each other. <laughs> right. So, what you want to do? What we'll do? We'll do some guided metta meditation, and, men, and you'll do loving kindness for yourself. And we'll do loving kindness for a loved person. And for that loved person, I want you to just think about it now for a minute. And I want you to choose somebody who's very easy and simple for you to love. Not necessarily the person you love the most, but the person you love the simplest. Okay. Often it might be someone like, say, uh, uh, a niece or nephew, you know, or maybe grandparents or something like that. Somebody who maybe is a little bit not quite as close to you. People you're, you're closest to, often you tend to have complicated <laughs> relationships with. Yeah, it can even be just someone that you meet, like a friend at work, someone at the Dhamma Center or something like that. It doesn't have to be particularly strong. But the important thing is that it's very pure. Okay. Otherwise, what happens is when you're meditating for a long time, all the issues come up. That's all. <laughs> Simple as that, right? And then you start thinking about them and trying to work out all your issues instead of doing the matta. Yeah? So you keep it simple. You know? And, you know, don't worry about it. Of course, the matter will help you to deal with all those issues. And we'll, we'll, uh, but the, the, in the meditation itself is not the time for working that out. One thing that people sometimes ask is if I do metta for somebody, will they know about it? Are they going to get the metta? What do you think? You think so? Yeah. Excellent. Why do you think that? Because we're all one. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I, th I suspect there's something to that, right? We kind of this illusion that we're separated from each other. But if you really think that, then if you want to follow the Buddhist path, then you should check it. You should test it, right? So you sit down at 7.30 at night and you do metta for Aunt Sally. And then the next morning you call her up and say, hey, Aunt Sally, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> so anything unusual happened last night? <laughs> Around about 7.30 or so? <laughs> <laughs> right. Why not, right? <laughs> be interesting to do that kind of experiment. You could see, like, does distance have an effect or anything like that? I, say, I tell you, one of the biggest regrets that I have in my monastic life, I, in my monastic life I have many, many regrets. <laughs> but the, one of the biggest ones is when uh, where I was at Wat Lanachat and uh, in Thailand. And, you know, I've been going to Ajahn Chat Chai and studying him and doing this kind of practice. And we got a letter, right? So this fellow from Canada wrote us this letter uh, and said, like, basically, dear monks, uh, uh, it, due to the uh, serious and imminent threat of an alien invasion, <laughs> we should send a monk up into space <laughs> to do metta for any aliens who may be approaching. <laughs> right? I volunteer. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, um, unfortunately, we, 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 we had to write back to him. We had to tell the truth. We had to say, look, we're so sorry, but the reality is it works just as well from the surface of the planet. So. <laughs> I <laughs> have to miss out on the, the, the space trip. <laughs> Which I'm sure would have happened, right? I'm sure that would have, would, have, would have been taken place. Anyway, where were we? Oh, yes, trying to be sensible. Okay. Right, so metta, so for oneself and for a loved person. Now, I, w- I want to just ask you a kind of question here, right? Because, okay, so th- tell me, who here thinks that they have a problem with loving themselves? Does anybody here think that? <laughs> some people you don't have to it's okay if you don't some people how many people about half the people a bit more okay yeah. it, it's become a kind of a um, received wisdom in kind of Western Buddhism that Western people hate themselves and Asian people don't hate themselves <laughs> and <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not as convinced that it's as straightforward as that. Uh, so yeah, I. Uh, I'm not so convinced that it's as straightforward as that. And I think that. I think that perhaps the difference is. Hmm. Anyway, I don't, perhaps too complicated to go into it. But anyway, this is what some people say, and I. I I'm reluctant to to kind of teach in that way or to adapt the meditation in that way or something because I suspect that what you end up doing is programming people to respond in that way. I think you you, you end up suggesting that kind of response rather than because I've do, I've done this a lot, right? And I've taught meta meditation, taught meta retreats a lot for a lot of people for many years, and I I don't just don't think it's like that. I think there's plenty of Western people who are actually fine with doing meta for themselves, and it's not a problem. But if you do find it's a problem, um, then uh, don't worry. We're just giving it a go for this evening. But you can always just do the meta for a loved person. Okay. Uh, some p- often people want to do meta for a cat or something like that. Right? I guess it's. <laughs> just remember, the only reason that he doesn't eat you is size. <laughs> Actually, although that's actually not all that true, I don't know. Have you seen the? There's a YouTube video of the story of Christian the lion. Have you seen that? Why don't you go into YouTube and look for it? It's about it's about a lion called Christian. He's not actually a Christian. <laughs> Just his name. All right. And uh, it's beautiful, actually. There's this the, in apparently in Harrods, like in the 60s or something like that. They used to sell lions cubs, lion cubs. So you could like go to Harrods and go to shopping and come home with a got a pet lion darling shall we raise this in the backyard so this is what they did and these and they had one that they raised they had like a big country home in England or something like that and they raised this this lion and uh, until it basically got too big and they thought no this is just cruel so they took it back to Africa and then they released it and then they came back like a year later to come and meet their lion yeah so I won't spoil it by telling you what happened yeah so if you go on YouTube, just Google Christian Lion. Anyway, it's a very nice video to lift you up if you're having difficulty feeling meta. Okay, where were we now? Okay, so meta, right. So for this this meditation, okay, for, so what we do for the... I'll just outline the meditation very briefly. The first thing we do is we just... We sit and practice with bare mindful awareness for a few minutes, okay? And that's not a bad thing to do for any meditation. Right? So you want to ground yourself and ground your mindfulness before beginning the meditation, that's fine. But with a metta meditation, it also has a very specific purpose because it gives you the chance to check your own emotions and especially if you're carrying any emotions of like annoyance or bad temper or anything like that into the, into the meditation. All right? And so you just get to check that. Now, it's usually speaking, it's not a good idea to start the metta meditation if you're really in a bad mood, okay? 
Why? Because what tends to happen then is that you tend to sort of have the metta which is kind of fighting the bad mood or the feeling of anger or whatever, and then it becomes a bit tense, and then you learn to associate the metta meditation with that kind of tension, and it becomes hard to make the feeling of metta come. Like once you've been doing it for a while, it doesn't really matter so much. But especially at the beginning, the trick at the beginning, the hard point, not really the hard point, but the tricky point, is to actually get that feeling of metta to light up inside you. And that's something which really is spontaneous and very just, it just happens. You can't control it and you can't predict it. But once you've seen it and once you sort of learn to tune into it, then you can do it whenever you want. All right? And you realize something which is very true, which is that you always have it. You always have that joy and that metta inside you. You can always access it. It's amazing. And you can just switch over and there it is. So when we're just beginning the practice, maybe you'll feel something, maybe you won't. It's okay. It's just a, just a very, very short initial try. Okay? But so we do the, the for, but first of all, we get ourselves in that neutral state of mind. We begin, we do metta for ourselves, and then we do metta for a loved person, and that'll be enough for this meditation. And so, our idea, the purpose of doing this, will be to see if we can evoke and feel something of what that feeling of joy is like inside us. Okay? We good to go? Okay, let's meditate, and uh, we'll see how, how long we go. Up to you, yeah. I'm sure it'll be very boring. <laughs> um, I'm good. I'm good now, thanks. Uh, um. Should we keep the light on or off? Off is better. Right? I, I did a guided meditation on the radio once. It was a drive time session. So I first had to give them a message saying, <laughs> please do not do this if you're driving. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> All right. As we sit quietly, let our body settle back into the posture 
and greet that posture with a welcome and smile. It's good to be back here. It's good to be back in this peaceful place. For a few minutes, scan the different parts of your body, noting the feelings of tension or pressure, just the physical sensations of the cloth on your skin. inside to see whether you have what, are, what emotions or moods that you're bringing in. Is there any feeling of ill will or restlessness, nervousness or fear, resentment, anything like that, anything especially any feelings on that negative side. Just notice those things and let them go. So to see that those unpleasant feelings, it's just not very nice to hold them. They don't feel very good. So just let them go. Let the mind come back and just be neutral. Be clear.
feels reasonably centered and settled. You say to yourself the words, may I be happy, may I be happy, may I be happy. And repeating those words again and again and again, evenly, steadily, clearly, enunciating them with care and attention, making a firm foundation for your mind. May I be happy, may I be happy, may I be happy. And as you keep on saying those words, keep your attention grounded and focused inside your body. Your, your attention can go anywhere in the body, it doesn't matter, but not outside.
And as you keep on reciting those words, you notice that because the words are steady and the intention is pure, and the mind is focused inside your body, the feeling of stillness and acceptance, then there might come a feeling like a like a little little light of joy. You can you can almost see it like a little candle flame inside you or like a patch of moonlight shining through the clouds. If you notice that feeling, then keep your mind with it. It might be just very slight or very elusive. Sometimes, maybe it's not. Sometimes it's very strong and powerful. But whatever it is, just keep your mind there and hold the feeling gently. Imagine it's just a little bird that you're holding in your mind. So keep that feeling safe. Keep it close.
and as the feeling becomes stronger more steady and let it spread out move your mind gently through your body taking that feeling of metta with you may I be happy may I be happy may I be happy Until you can feel that beautiful warm feeling of metta right throughout your whole body <coughs> just keeping your body and your awareness <coughs> so imagine that your body is like a like a crystal buddha filled with light lit with a candlelight You can feel your metta through your whole body.
keeping the mind just as it is not moving or anything and just bring in the name of that loved person may that loved one be happy may that loved one be happy so if I choose my father then may my father be happy may my father be happy may my father be happy or whoever it is that you've chosen for your loved one May they be happy, may they be happy, may they be happy.
finally we can spread the metta to all the people in this room. May all the people in this room be happy. May all the people in this room be happy. May all the people in this room be happy. And filling the whole room with that beautiful, warm feeling of love and joy. to the loved person, may that loved one be happy, may that loved one be happy, may that loved one be happy, to oneself, may I be happy, may I be happy, may I be happy, and then letting the words of metta go, letting the feeling of loving kindness fade away, and allowing the mind to come back to a neutral space empty, open and clear. And with the mind empty and clear, take a minute to reflect back over the meditation we've just done together. Inquiring into cause and effect. What just happened? How did I use my mind? How did my mind change? Did that feeling of metta, did that come up at all? What was it like? Was it smooth or excited or how did it feel like? And finally, we can dedicate the merit of our practice. May all beings be happy. May all beings be well. May all beings realize awakening and peace. Sadhu, sadhu. You can slowly open your eyes and come out of the meditation. If you want to uh, stand up, stretch your legs or something, please feel free. <laughs>